Hello, this is Shmuel Moshe, and you are listening to the Weekly Parsha Cast, the weekly Torah portion podcast where I read the weekly Torah portion and then give my own interpretation based on what I think it all meant. As always, I remind everyone I am not a professional Torah scholar, just somebody who wanted to study the Torah. This week's portion is Shemini, which means eighth, and it is found starting at the beginning of chapter 9 in Leviticus, Vaikra. And we'll be getting started right at the top there. This week's portion falls on Shabbat, the 27th of Adar Bet, 5784, April 6th, 2024. Let's begin. For those who want to follow along in English, visit Chabad.org for my version of the translation. Chapter 9, verse 1. And it was on the eighth day that Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf as a sin offering, and a ram as a burnt offering, both unblemished, and bring them near before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a he-goat as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both in their first year, and both unblemished, as a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram as peace offerings to slaughter before the Lord, and a meal offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord is appearing to you. And they took what Moses had commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the entire community approached and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing the Lord has commanded. Do it, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, Approach the altar and perform your sin offering and your burnt offering, atoning for yourself and for the people, and perform the people's sacrifice, atoning for them, as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron approached the altar and slaughtered his sin offering calf. And Aaron's sons brought forward the blood to him, and he dipped his finger into the blood, placing some on the horns of the altar, and he poured the blood at the base of the altar. And the fat, the kidneys, and the diaphragm with the liver from the sin offering he caused to go up in smoke on the altar, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he burned the flesh and the hide in fire outside the camp. And he slaughtered the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented the blood to him, and he dashed it on the altar around. And they presented the burnt offering to him in its prescribed pieces, along with the head, and he caused them to go up and smoke on the altar. And he washed the innards and the legs, and he caused them to go up and smoke on the altar along with the burnt offering. And he brought forward the people's sacrifice. He took the people's sin offering goat, slaughtered it, and made it a sin offering like the first one. And he brought forward the burnt offering and prepared it according to the law. That concludes the first portion, so a very lovely ceremony. This is really something very beautiful. You know, you would almost hear in the background triumphant, pleasant, beautiful music as Aaron is ascending to fulfill his role as the high priest and making the sin offering for the people. It's a beautiful moment. It's a momentous moment, one of the most important moments, as this is how the people of Israel are to be redeemed, and he is fulfilling that right for the first time. So very, very nice. And also his sons are involved bringing the blood and so on. They are fulfilling their roles. How beautiful. On to the second portion. Chapter 9, verse 17. And he brought forward the meal offering, filled his palm with it, and caused it to go up in smoke on the altar, in addition to the morning burnt offering. And he slaughtered the ox and the ram, the people's peace offering, and Aaron's sons presented the blood to him, and he dashed it on the altar around. And they also presented the fats from the ox and from the ram, the tail, the fatty covering, the kidneys, and the diaphragm with the liver. And they placed the fats on top of the breasts, and he caused the fats to go up in smoke on the altar. And Aaron had already waved the breasts and the right thigh as a wave offering before the Lord, as Moses had commanded. And Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. He then descended from preparing the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. Then they came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all of the people. Beautiful. End of the portion, right? So, very straightforward. Aaron continues the process, does the meal offering and everything, does the slaughtering, and then with the sons doing their part once again, afterwards the two brothers head into the tent and then come out, and the Spirit of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, appears to all the people. Right? They, they feel God's presence. Now we move into the third portion. Chapter 9, verse 24. And fire went forth from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fats upon the altar, and all the people saw, sang praises, and fell upon their faces. Chapter 10. And Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, each took his pan, put fire in them, and placed incense upon it. And they brought before the Lord foreign fire, which he had not commanded them. And fire went forth from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke. 
when he said, I will be sanctified through those near to me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron was silent. And Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Draw near, carry your kinsmen from within the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. So they approached and carried them with their tunics to the outside of the camp as Moses had spoken. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Itamar, his sons, Do not leave your heads unshorn, and do not rend your garments, so that you shall not die, and lest he be angry with the entire community. But your brothers, the entire house of Israel, shall bewail the conflagration that the Lord has burned. And do not go out of the entrance of the tent of meeting, lest you die, because the Lord's anointing oil is upon you. And they did according to Moses' order. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine that will lead to intoxication, neither you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, so that you shall not die. This is an eternal statute for your generations, to distinguish between holy and profane, and between unclean and clean, and to instruct the children of Israel regarding all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Thus concludes the third portion. After such a great celebration, the death of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Avihu, is a tragedy. Aaron has fulfilled his promise, his role, and as he and Moses are in the tent of meeting, these two boys, they grab their pans and put the fire, and it is not what they were told to do by God. But they were so moved, we can assume, they were so moved by the presence of God and so eager to be close to God that they acted in this way. But unfortunately, they were playing with fire, quite literally. This is, when you try to think about what it's like, you could think of fire in general, or you could think of other things like electricity, right? There are great, important, powerful uses for these things, but we must do them in consideration of what is proper and what is told of us. These two did things outside of what they were commanded, and unfortunately, their demands as the high priest's sons, as Kohanim, were to be by the book. Anybody making an unwanted or foreign fire to begin with, or an alien fire, already is running a very high risk of God punishing them, particularly just, I don't want to compare God to an alligator, but think of it like feeding time at the zoo. The fire that was done here had an offering to consume what was brought out. Aaron had done it. So the presence and glory of God is already there. And while this incredibly powerful force is present, suddenly the two of them put a foreign fire before them, intermix it with the glory, and suddenly they are consumed and killed for their impudence. It is not what they meant to do, but they unfortunately are purged by that fire. Such is how it must be. Now, immediately, immediately, Aaron is told by Moses a very important statement. This is what the Lord spoke to me. I will be sanctified through those near to me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron was silent. Aaron just lost his two sons. He did so at the height of a most wonderful moment of his life. He got promoted to this amazing office, and he just fulfilled the, the redemption of the people, and now his two boys are gone. And Moses reminds him, I will be sanctified through those near to me. That's you. And before all the people, I will be glorified. Which means, do not say something disparaging. Do not argue and do not object to what just happened. Because if you do, you will be acting in direct violation of what the Lord spoke to me about your sanctification or about God being sanctified through you, those near to me, right? The Kohanim. And before all the people, everyone's looking at you right now. Everyone's watching you, brother. Don't move. Don't say something you'll regret. Do not invoke the Lord's wrath. Don't forget what you are commanded to do, even in this moment of suffering. Remember. And he does so. He stays silent. So, speaking in that way to Aaron, Moses definitively made sure to save him from doing something wrong. If he was going to, he may not have at all. But, nonetheless, 
Aaron stayed silent. Now, summoning the kinsmen, right? Moses tells them, to, the, the nephews, basically, or the cousins. Yeah, they're, they're cousins. They're, it seems to be first cousins. So they're Aaron's uncle Uziel, um, Mishael and El, Elzaphon. Draw near, carry your kinsmen from within the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. So basically, the uh, the cousins are being called to take the bodies of Nadav and Avihu and remove them from the sanctuary and bring them outside of the camp. Why? Because the Kohanim cannot come into contact with a dead body. So even though it is his son, even though it is the brothers that have died, it doesn't matter. The Kohanim have a set, strict rule, and... They cannot break it even for their own family. It must be honored to keep them pure while they are still wearing the anointed oil and the holy garments. They must remain calm and they cannot intervene with the removal of the corpses. Moses elaborates on this further. Do not leave your heads unshorn. Do not rend your garments so that you shall not die. And lest he be angry with the entire community, but your brothers, the entire house of Israel, shall bewail the conflagration. Okay, so he's basically, Moses is saying, listen, I know you want to grieve. I know. Don't. Do not tear your holy garments. Do not cry out. Do not weep. We will do it. The rest of us will cry for you. The rest of us will wail for you and cut, rip our garments. But you must not. You must not do it. You have a holy mission. You cannot jeopardize that now. You will die. Don't do it. And then furthermore, do not go out of the entrance of the tent of meeting lest you die because the Lord's anointing oil is upon you. Right? So all this, you can't imagine the stress, the strain, the pain that they're going through in this moment. They just lost Nadav and Avihu, brothers, sons, but they have to just sit there and bear it and finish what they are there to do. And furthermore, the Lord now, in this moment, he speaks directly to Aaron in this holy moment. Normally it's Moses hears from God, God, and then relays that message, right? No, the Lord spoke to Aaron and told him, don't drink wine, you or your sons, when you come in here so that you won't die, all right? Because... We need to be able to distinguish between holy and profane, clean and unclean, all right? And this is going to be, also, you're going to be responsible for leading all of the people according to what has been said to Moses. So remember, you need to be sober. You need to be of sound mind so that you can be able to make the distinctions. And, you know, in the the case of the holiday of Purim, which just passed, right, it becomes, you, you want to get so drunk that they say that you can't tell right from wrong. That's the whole entire point, right, is is the, the impossibility of knowing. But in the case of here, the, the judges being one thing, the high priest being the most high office, you must know right from wrong at all times, clean and unclean. Like, this is super important. Do not be drunk on the job, period. Thus concludes the third portion. On to the fourth, chapter 10, verse 12. And Moses spoke to Aaron and his surviving sons, Eleazar and Itamar, Take the meal offering that is left over from the Lord's fire offerings, and eat it as unleavened loaves beside the altar, for it is a holy of holies. You shall eat it in a holy place, because it is your portion and your son's portion from the Lord's fire offerings, for so I have been commanded. The breast of the waving and the thigh of the raising up you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you. For as your portion and your son's portion they have been given from the peace offerings of the children of Israel. They shall bring the thigh of the raising up and the breast of the waving upon the fats for the fire offering. To wave is a waving before the Lord, and it shall belong to you and to your sons with you as an eternal due as the Lord has commanded. So now we're getting some more clarification. Moses and Aaron, everything has to continue as planned. Remember, you get what's left over. This is your portion. You, your sons, and your daughters. Eat it. Do what you got to do. The waving and so on. Do your job. You know what to do. I'm once again reminding you, this is your task. Fairly straightforward, but it's also, again, the emphasis is on, you know, I know this all just happened to you, but you still got to do your job, and they do. On to the fifth portion, chapter 10, verse 16. And Moses thoroughly investigated concerning the sin offering he goat, and behold, it had been burnt. So he was angry with Eleazar and Itamar, Aaron's surviving sons, saying, 
Why did you not eat the sin offering in the holy place? For it is holy of holies, and he has given it to you to gain forgiveness for the sin of the community, to effect their atonement before the Lord. Behold, its blood was not brought into the sanctuary within, so you should have surely eaten it within holy precincts as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, But today, did they offer up their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord? But if tragic events like these had befallen me, and if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have pleased the Lord? Moses heard this, and it pleased him. So, here, we have to, we have to consider all of these things, right? Because this is, actually, for me, probably one of the most confusing passages, but clearly Aaron played very smart here. So, the two brothers, obviously, they're, they're making mistakes here. Moses investigated the sin offering he goat. It had been burnt. So, he's lectures, he scolds the two sons, why did you not eat the sin offering in the holy place? Right? It is the holy of holies. So, like, he gave it to you for this purpose. Behold, its blood was not brought into the sanctuary within, so you should have surely eaten it within holy precincts. Right? So, there's a specific rule. Aaron says, Today, did they offer up their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord? So, perhaps it's because of what happened to their brothers, perhaps it's because Aaron is technically the one whose job it is to do it. I'm not 100%. But basically, Aaron was able to very cleverly diffuse the situation by saying, today, did they offer up their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord? But if tragic events like these had befallen me, and if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have pleased the Lord? So I think it's considering... You know, eating a sin offering when something so tragic happens, you know, it's basically, it basically, they, they get a bereavement excuse, seems to be the case, because Aaron logically explained it. Unfortunately, this is one of my weaker arguments or explanations uh, of, you know, I, I don't feel like it's a very strong compared to the other ones, but I think the general takeaway is, not that I explicitly want to say this is what happened, but, you know, if we're going to be really practical about fire offerings. and th So Aaron made the offering earlier, right? It was Aaron who did the offering. And then he returned to the tent of meeting with Moses. So it wasn't their job, right? They're not the ones who did it. And, and so he's basically saying, look, look what I just went through and look what I did. So would this have pleased the Lord? And, and Moses found the answer acceptable. Also, we can consider the fact that Nadav and Avihu themselves are inadvertently a fire burnt offering in their own way. So that's not that they didn't mean to, but they did go up in fire. So perhaps, you know, the, the boys just don't have the appetite. Either way, you know, Aaron found a way to diffuse the conversation. Sixth portion, chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron to say to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the creatures that you may eat among all the animals on earth. Any animal that has a cloven hoof that is completely split into double hooves, and which brings up its cud, that one you may eat. But these you shall not eat. Among those that bring up the cud, and those that have a cloven hoof, the camel, because it brings up its cud, and does not have a completely cloven hoof, it is unclean for you. And the hyrax, because it brings up its cud, but will not have a completely cloven hoof, it is unclean to you. And the hare, because it brings up its cud, but does not have a completely cloven hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig, because it has a cloven hoof that is completely split, but will not regurgitate its cud, it is unclean for you. You shall not eat of their flesh, and you shall not touch their carcasses, they are unclean for you. Among all the creatures that are in the water, you may eat these. Any of the creatures in the water that has fins and scales, those you may eat, whether it lives in the waters, in the seas, or in the rivers. But any creatures that do not have fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, among all the creeping creatures in the water, and among all living creatures that live in the water, are an abomination for you. And they shall be an abomination for you. You shall not eat of their flesh, and their dead bodies you shall hold in abomination. Any creature that does not have fins and scales in the water is an abomination for you. Among birds, you shall hold these in abomination. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle or the griffin vulture, the kite, the osprey, the kestrel and the vulture after its species, and the raven after its species, the ostrich, the jay, and the sparrow hawk, and the goshawk after its species, the owl, the gull, the little owl, the bat, the starling, the magpie, the stork, the heron after its species, the hoopoe, and the ataleph, and flying insect that walks on all fours, it is an abomination to you. 
However, among all the flying insects that walk on four legs, you may eat from those that have jointed leg-like extensions above its regular legs, with which they hop on the ground. From this locust category, you may eat the following. The red locust after its species, the yellow locust after its species, the spotted gray locust after its species, and the white locust after its species. But any other flying insect that has four legs is an abomination for you. And through these, you will become unclean. Anyone who touches their dead bodies will be unclean until evening. And anyone who carries their carcass shall immerse his garments, and he shall be unclean until evening. And any animal that has a cloven hoof that is not completely split and which does not bring up its cud is unclean for you. Anyone who touches them shall become unclean. And among all the animals that walk on four legs, any animal that walks on its paws is unclean for you. Anyone who touches their carcass will be unclean until evening. And one who carries their carcass shall immerse his garments, and he will be unclean until evening. They are unclean for you. And this is unclean for you among creeping creatures that creep on the ground, the weasel, the mouse, and the toad after its species, the hedgehog, the chameleon, the lizard, the snail, and the mole. These are the ones that are unclean for you. Among all creeping creatures, anyone who touches them when they are dead will be unclean until evening. And if any of these dead creatures falls upon anything, it shall become unclean, whether it is any wooden vessel, garment, hide, or sack, any vessel with which work is done, it shall be immersed in water, but will remain unclean until evening, and it will become clean. All right. So that concludes the portion. Here now we're learning about the laws of kosher animals, things that you can eat and not eat. I'm not going to go into it a whole lot. I just gave you the full list. But basically, when it comes to land animals, things that have either a split hoof, that's like a cloven hoof, and also bring up the cud, so like they eat grass, you know, those animals are fine. But then animals that don't do that because they only have one but not the other, they are not fine. And I also can assume if it has neither that, uh, you know, Case by case, right? But basically, don't eat those animals that, that have that condition. So uh, I think stuff like dogs, cats, they don't really seem to fit that description, do they? So don't eat those creatures either. Also, the, the you know mice and weasels and various types of birds, and especially like uh, carrion-eating birds, the birds that eat carcasses, not good, not clean. Specifically, locusts specific kinds of locusts like grasshoppers you know the specific colors the species it gives those two and then also when it comes to things that live in the water if it has fins and scales it's good otherwise no good it's really that simple and again touching these creatures they make you unclean so keep that in mind now on to the seventh portion oh yeah and just a general note cleanliness right so immerse yourself it means like take a bath right particularly a ritual bath and also at the end of the day in the evening things become clean so sun, sundown, suddenly it, it, it is cleaned up. Seventh portion, chapter 11, verse 33. But any earthenware vessel into whose interior any of them falls, whatever is inside it shall become unclean, and you shall break the vessel itself. Of any food that is usually eaten upon which water comes will be unclean, and any beverage that is usually drunk which is in any vessel shall become unclean, and anything upon which any of their carcasses of these animals fall will become unclean. Thus an oven or stove that shall be demolished, they are unclean, and they shall be unclean for you. But a spring or a cistern, a gathering of water, remains clean. However, one who touches their carcass shall become unclean. And if their carcass falls upon any sowing seed which is to be sown, it remains clean. But if water is put upon the seeds, and any of their carcass falls on them, they are unclean for you. If any animal that you normally eat dies, the one who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening. And one who eats its carcass shall immerse its garments, and he shall be unclean until evening. And one who carries its carcass shall immerse his garments, and he shall be unclean until evening. And any creeping creature that creeps on the ground is an abomination, it shall not be eaten. Any creature that goes on its belly, and any creature that walks on four legs, to any creature that has many legs among all creeping creatures that creep on the ground, you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping creature that creeps, and you shall not defile yourselves with them, for that you should become unclean through them. For I am the Lord your God, and you shall sanctify yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. And you shall not defile yourselves through any creeping creature that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who has brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, because I am holy. This is the law regarding animals, birds, all living creatures that move in water, and all creatures that creep on the ground, to distinguish between the clean and the unclean, and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. Thus concludes the seventh portion. So... More of these laws regarding kosher stuff, right? Again, people talk about, is it kosher? Well, here we are. So earthenware vessels. So imagine like a clay pot. If it's made of clay earthenware, you can't just clean it by soaking it. You have to actually destroy it. Same thing with ovens and stoves. They have to be destroyed. They can't be cleaned. But if it's a spring or a cistern, a gathering of water remains clean. 
But one who touches the carcass of something, that person becomes unclean. So water has this purification quality in its natural state. Now, interestingly, it also talks about seeds, right? So let's say you have like a, a let's say you have some pumpkin seeds sitting on the ground and you drop a carcass on the seeds. The pumpkin seeds are still okay to use, but if you wet the seeds, after that, it's no longer clean if something touches it. So the water has the ability to not only clean some things, but also make it possible to be uh, make other things unclean. Keep that in mind. Another thing, so like if an animal dies before you get to slaughter it properly, that's considered a carcass. And sure enough, the person who touches that carcass, unclean until evening. Beyond that, he has to clean all of his garments as well. And uh, same with anybody carrying it. But we go into the details, you know, basically the Lord summarizes, those are all the things that are clean and unclean when it comes to what you can eat and what you can touch. I've given you all the scoop, whether it's a bug or a bird or a who knows what. Now you know what you are and are not allowed to do because you must be holy because I am holy and I brought you up out of Egypt. So you must be like me. Be holy. Don't be unclean. That is my commandment. So there you have it. That's the conclusion of the portion. And that concludes this week's collective Torah portion. So there you have it in a nutshell. Interesting the ways it jumps around. First, it goes from Aaron's ability to to be you know, doing the first sacrifice and redeeming the people. And then suddenly his sons die and all this and all that. I mean, it's a very, very powerful moment. But then, you know, it goes into the rules more, more in detail. You know, Aaron's told you must remain clean, right? So after he's been raised to this high level, God tells him about being able to discern clean from unclean. And then we go into the examples of clean versus unclean. So basically he's giving some fine examples of this is the kind of stuff you're going to need to be sober enough to tell us. Is the animal clean? This is a great example for you to learn from. It's also great for everybody to know what is acceptable to eat. Going back, though, I think the most important thing here, the most prominent thing here is Aaron. And his, and his sons, how they conduct themselves. This is really the thing that I think is the most powerful from this portion. So let's break it down one more time. Aaron's in the best moment of his life, possibly. Suddenly his sons are killed and he has to sit there and stay quiet. He cannot disparage God. This is such a potent moment because Moses is even telling him like, I know what you're feeling. Don't say the wrong thing. And it shows the conviction and the discipline and the maturity that Aaron had, as well as the fear. He, he just understood that if I complain right now, if I say anything, if I if I disparage God or, or cry about God's judgment, I am destroying our people because I am the one who's supposed to basically be the connection now to fulfill the commands given to Moses to our people. The Kohanim are supposed to be the ones to fulfill that and observe that and if I say God's justice was unjust, if, if I say that something God chose to do was wrong, I have done the worst job at sanctifying God. I have made God look bad, and I cannot do that. So he bit his tongue and stayed quiet, even though he knew how much it hurt. He had to accept it's God. God has the authority, and I have to say, yes, sir, that is my role. And this is also a really important example, going to the Purim story again, right? When Esther becomes chosen for Purim, or p chosen to become one of the many brides of, of the king, you know, the whole thing happens because the original queen, Vashti, says, I, you know, the, the king says, come Vashti, dance for me and my guests. And she says, I don't want to, I'm not going to go. The problem was, the second she disrespected him like that, it has a ripple effect. If they don't do something about that, the problem is going to be all the people of the kingdom are now going to have the same opinion that they can disrespect the king and the wives are going to have the opinion that they can disrespect their husbands because after all, the queen just did it. So everybody else should think that that's okay. So unfortunately the for her, the king had no choice but to take action. In this case, here we have a very similar instance. The king, the king of kings, the Lord has made a decree. He took the lives of Nadav and Avihu. Aaron has two choices. He can either A, say something negative about that or show his disapproval, which would be the same thing as the queen telling the king no in front of everybody because all eyes are on him, or B, he can bite his tongue, endure this, be glorified in his position, and in doing so also show the people that if I, the high priest, 
can stomach this loss and can bear it because of God's righteousness, you can bear anything. So this moment shows that not even the high priests are immune, also that they are willing to stand by God no matter what. And thirdly, it's actually an affirmation of the warning. If you do these things, God warned many times, you will surely die, right? You will die. So don't, don't do it lest you die. We have seen firsthand, nobody's immune. In fact, the Kohanim are even more so are at risk. Tearing their garments too would put them at risk, but we just saw Nadav and Avihu got killed despite being the next in line. There's nobody who's immune to the law of God on this matter. Don't play dumb. Don't be stupid. Play it safe, observe the commandments, and the Kohanim will survive. Nonetheless, that's the end of my conclusion and, and summary for today's parasha. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found it educational and informative. I certainly find this to be one of the most powerful portions in the entire Torah. Uh, I've heard somebody once say that the two sons being killed is like, in a way, it was almost a blessing because they got brought close to God. And, and that's the thing. They just wanted to be closer to God. That's why they did it. They were like, oh, man, look what dad just did. Oh, man, I want to be close to God. Yeah, me too. Let's do it. Ah, horrible. So, you know, they, they had good intentions, but they did it the wrong way. And it shows that even sometimes intentions don't matter if you disobey the commandment. So keep that in mind. Intentions are important. With humans, we have to consider intentions, but we also have to be mindful that even with the right intentions, we could still do the wrong thing. So be cautious as you proceed through your life. Until next time, this has been Shmuel Moshe with the Weekly Parashah Cast. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll tune in next time. Baruch Hashem.